welcome back to learn skn and today we have an economics video for you we have the mid june 2022 economics csec economics paper one so i was linked with this paper from a member of the community they asked me to do it on online and so here i am thank so shout out to you you know who you are for linking learn skn with this paper and just let me say anybody else have any 22 2022 paper ones especially for pov feel free to email it to learn skn at outlook.com so that we can run through that paper and we can see if we can help each other pass this this exam all right also some more housekeeping remember in the description they can click the links to you know get a link to some past papers that have been completed some syllabus and textbooks and some powerpoints that have been combined so that you can put them all in one package to get your study on all right so without further ado let's jump right into this one number one which of the following items is a primary product and you can see that this person already you know scratch off what their, their answer might have been in the exam but let's see if they are correct so it's truck bread bauxite clothing so which of the following item is a primary product and of course the best answer here is bauxite so the best answer is bauxite so that's c because we know that all the others the truck was um manufactured so that's secondary the bread baked so that's processed so that's secondary clothing again made from fabric so that's secondary so bauxite is the primary product right there number two the government of country p decides to move resources from manufacturing to the crop production the opportunity cost of the decision is the and again the person answered the best way they know how so we'll see if they are correct so the options are a rent for the land on which crops are grown b profits earned from manufacturing c wages earned by farm workers or d profits earned by farmers and so you know opportunity cost is all about the what you gave up so the cost is whatever you gave up the foregone option and so in this case they gave up the production the manufacturing in order to produce more crops and so the opportunity cost is whatever they would have earned from manufacturing so the profits earned from manufacturing that's for that's foregone and so that's the opportunity cost uh let's go now number three which of the following is not a way in which governments influence the economic decisions of businesses a increasing retirement benefits b passing minimum wage legislation c regulating the emissions of toxic waste or d identifying areas where businesses should be located so which is not a way to influence economic decisions and so the best answer here is a increasing the retirement benefits because that doesn't really impact whether i locate my business here or there this doesn't really impact what factors of production i use etc so it is a i mean you don't even have to give retirement benefits if you don't want to based on whatever scheme you have in place so increasing retirement benefits they can just stick to the bare minimum and that wouldn't really be a government thing government can insist that you give them more than so number four deals with this diagram which refers to the following diagram which illustrates the PP, ppf or the production possibility frontier for an economy that is capable of producing bauxite and sugar in different combinations so you have them right here so you see the map right here the graph right here so the question ask point x on the diagram above represents what so this is point x that's outside of the ppf so what does that represent and so i see the person selected d so i'm wondering if they are correct let's see if they are correct so number four the answer is d unattainable all right so it's unattainable once it's outside here the answer is d unattainable combination once it's outside of the ppf that means that whatever resources the country has aren't enough to reach that level of production so it's unattainable Number five, an economy is best described as, we have A, B, C, and D. An economy is best described as a system where suppliers produce all the goods and services needed by consumers, 
B, the utilization of resources by manufacturers to produce goods and maximize profits. C, the utilization of resources to produce goods and services to meet the needs and wants of society. D, a system whereby all the goods and services used by citizens of the country are provided by the government. And I see the person going through a process of elimination. So they say, okay, can't be B, can't be D. Maybe it is A or C. In the end, they went with C, which is the correct answer. So number five is C. That is indeed the correct answer for that question, number five. Number six. So you could, you could tell the person kind of sneak out this one here. Like, oh, they, they, you know, they, they have to do their best to take the pick of that particular paper. So we see here, number six. Country X allows the foreign exchange market to determine the rate of its domestic currency based on the forces of supply and demand. This type of exchange rate is referred to as, and I see there, you had fixed, pegged, floating, managed. And so the best answer for number six is C, floating. The floating exchange rate is the best answer for number six. Number seven, economic choices are made because... And so we have people's needs exceed their wants. People may not have the money to conduct business. Resources are unlimited and people's wants are limited. Resources are scarce while people's wants are unlimited. So what's the best answer for this one? Let's see what we have here. So the person chose D. Let's see if they are correct. Number seven, D. Resources are scarce while people's wants are unlimited. That is why you have to make choices because of the simple fact of scarcity. We, are, we have limited resources, but unlimited wants. Number eight, resources, both human and physical, are required to provide, produce goods. The statement above most accurately describes, and so the options are A, productivity, B, entrepreneurship, C, factors of production, or D, factors of productivity so we know there's no such thing as factors of productivity in a sense and we know what entrepreneurship is you know taking the risk and so we're going to look at what the best answer here is the person selected c do i agree with that option yes the option is c factors of production that's the best description for factors of production you would realize that the human effort would be of course things like uh, labor the physical ones would be more like land, capital, and also human would be entrepreneurship because that's a human skill. Right? So the factors of production fall nicely into that category. Number nine. Which of the following pairs of activities in a country falls under the tertiary sector? So earlier we dealt with the primary level of production. Now we're looking at a tertiary sector. And so which pair belongs to the tertiary sector? We have A, banking and tourism, B, tourism and agriculture, C, banking and construction, and D, manufacturing and fishing. So you see some of these have the first and primary and secondary intertwined. Only one peer is totally tertiary, and that is number nine. The one peer is, let's see here, yeah, A, banking and tourism. So number nine, the answer is A, banking and tourism. Number 10, which of the following is a reward to a factor of production? We have A, taxes paid to the government, B, annual review of employee performance, C, profits declared by a company in the annual report, or D, managerial skills of the manager of a business. And so what is the best answer for number 10? Let's see, the answer is, of course, the seat right there. The answer is C, profits earned by a company in the annual report so you know that the reward for entrepreneurship is profits the reward for land is rent the reward for capital is interest the reward for labor is either wage or salary so the reward for entrepreneurship use that skill to earn profits number 11 so I attempt 11 and 12 before the following table which shows the cost of production for a small business so we have it here, all right? And of course, you know, this is a repeat again. You have seen this before. So the question asks, the fixed cost of production is, and we see them have here zero, right? Zero is the fixed cost of production, A, but 
we have other options is it b 50 is it c 200 or d 410 let's see what the answer for number 11 is and so we have 200 as the fixed cost why we choose 200 because we realize here even when they produce zero loaves of bread there was still a, there was still a cost attached to that which is 200 remember fixed costs don't change during production whether you produce one zero five your fixed cost remains the same that's why they call it fixed cost right because the total cost here doesn't include any variable cost because there was no production so that has to be the overheads the fixed cost so that's why the answer is 200 and then number 12 is asking us the marginal cost of production between two and four loaves of bread is is it 25 is it 50 is it 100 or is it 550 so what's the answer for number 12 the marginal cost we go with $50 why we say $50 if you look at the table here right at first without any kind of production going on the total cost is 200 and remember that total cost is a combination of variable cost plus fixed cost so variable cost plus fixed cost equal total cost so now we come down here to where we're producing two loaves of bread and then realize that the total cost is 250 so we know out of the 250 out of the 250 200 is a fixed cost it doesn't change and so if you look at the table we look at the table we realize that the quantity of bread the percent remember to find marginal cost it is percentage change in the quantity sorry percentage change in cost over percentage change in quantity that's marginal cost formula the percentage change in cost over the percentage change in quantity and we know that in normal textbooks they normally have the percentage change in quantity normally just one so make just one two three four five but this time we're counting in twos and so there will be a different percentage change here over here we can identify that there are some different intervals different change in total cost based on output but they're asking us for two at between two and four that's why they're asking us number 12 between cost of production between two and four loaves of bread and so if you look at the percentage change in the cost it's 300 minus the 250 and so that's just 50 dollars there's a difference difference right there 50 dollars you can see it from 250 to 3 so 50 dollars is the difference and the difference is the change is from 42 is two dollars is two two uh loaves of bread and so two divided by the 50 would give us 25 the person that worked out here so the two divided by the 50 gives us 25 and so that is the marginal cost for the production of the loaf of bread between two and four so that's the marginal cost for that one 25 so six kind of mixing things up different to what we would have learned in our classes you have to actually use the formula now is that automatic number 13 an advantage of a plant economic system is that options a consumers have a wider variety of goods b workers are more motivated and diligent c firms have a greater incentive to be efficient or d there is usually a more equitable distribution of wealth so what's the answer for this one okay so we know that because it's a planned economy you don't have much variety in goods as a customer you don't you just have what the government choose to allow to be sold workers are more motivated and diligent you know that's not true workers tend to be feeling a little you know restricted they have less freedom and so sometimes they are forced to do what they have they, the job that they are doing it's not really like they have a choice sometimes uh firms have a great incentive to be efficient no because the profit motive has been removed because remember it's the state that's performing economic activities and so there's no profit motive and so there's no incentive to be real efficient remember government is one of the most inefficient organizations out there so that leaves what d so the answer for number 13 is d there's usually more equitable usually more equitable let's move this out the way more equitable distribution of wealth now they say there is usually right because one of the idea of the planned economy is that everybody should be equal and so if that means all of us equal in poverty so be it right and most times 
we're not all equal in rich in being wealthy it's normally the, the, the opposite number 14 refers to the table right here which shows government spending as a percentage of gross domestic product for four countries w x y z so we have them here government spending as a percentage of gdp for w is 47 for x 89 for y it's 50 and for z it's 3 so the question asks which economic system of country X is most likely? So which economic system is country X? Is it mixed? Is it planned? Is it subsistence? Or is it free market? And so the best answer for 14 is... We'll go with planned. Why we go with planned? Because we realize that government spending as a percentage of GDP is almost all. Which means government controls almost all economic activities almost all spending in the economy that is why government spending is so high because government is the main source of everything almost everything in that country and as such they would spend a lot they, they would provide health they would provide the education provide other social welfare uh, related activities maybe housing food subsidies those kind of things so you realize that the government is spending a lot of money and so therefore it has to be a planned economy. Number 15. When bargain supermarket increased the price of tissue by 65%, tissue sales fell by 115%. Therefore, the price elasticity of demand for bargains tissue is so we have elastic, inelastic, perfectly elastic, and perfectly inelastic. So the best answer here, okay, so you realize that there's a reaction. Right, so first and foremost, there is a reaction to the change in price. Price went up and sales fell, which means it is elastic. Right, so demand is elastic. If it was inelastic, there would hardly be any change in the sales as the price increased. But because sales fell by that much, we know that demand is elastic. Right, and so. We are going to say that the answer is A, elastic demand. And you can also simply divide the 115 by the 65, and you would realize that it's greater than 1, and so that would indicate that the product is elastic. So let's see how we can, if we can just show you that one quickly. So it's 115. Five divided by six five and we get 1.77 and so that's greater than one and so that's elastic demand number so we have it right here circled number 15 is elastic demand okay if it was inelastic it would have if it was perfectly elastic it would have gone to zero right it would have changed to zero okay let's go uh, number 16 refers to the table which shows the market for golden apples so we have a market for golden apples right here you have quantity demanded quantity supplied good which of the following statement is true a there is no shortage of golden apples at four dollars b there is a shortage of 150 apples at five dollars c there's a surplus of 300 golden apples at two dollars or D, there's a surplus of one of 450 golden apples at one dollar. So let's break it down. So at so A, we said there's no shortage of golden apples at four. So at four, we have market in equilibrium. When a market is in equilibrium, that means that there's no shortage, there's no surplus, is market clearing. That is why that is where quantity demand equal quantity supply. So therefore, is market clearing. So we don't have to go any further than that. The answer is A, there is no shortage of golden apples at $4 because at $4 we have, of course, the market clearing price, which is the equilibrium price. And so the answer for that. So for number 17 now, all things being equal, an increase in the supply of goods will result in, we have A, an increase in both price and quantity traded. B, a decrease in both price and quantity traded. C, an increase in price and a decrease in quantity traded. Or D, a decrease in price and an increase in quantity traded. So, they kind of got run the gamut here. 
So these ones normally these are very simple when it comes around supply and demand. Once you draw a graph, you'll be you'll see the answer coming out one time. And so I went to paint and I knock up a little graph here. Alright, so the first thing would be of course S1 and D. Remember they said says it was part of us. So all things remaining equal, which means demand remain the same. So even though initially you had the market in equilibrium where the price was up here, you know, P1, supply was here, demand was here. Quantity demanded equi uh, equilibrium quantity was here. But then when the supply increased, there's a supply increase. Nothing else changes. Eh? Supply increase. It just moves all of the a shift the supply curve to the right to indicate that supply increased. Right? You shift it to the, the right to indicate that supply increased. And we know off the bat, if supply goes up, demand remains the same, then we know the price is not gonna rise. The price is not gonna rise. And so the price did not rise. What happened to the price instead? It fell. Because there's so much more out there in the market, but the demand isn't really matching up, as you can see right here. So the price went down on the shift, but what happened is that the quantity goes up because naturally it increases, increases the supply, so the quantity goes up. And so you can see that the best answer here is D, which says a decrease in price and an increase in the quantity traded right so that's the best answer for that one just draw the graph and you'll see all of it just coming true number 18 item 18 refers to the following diagram which rep which represents a monopoly firm okay so we see the monopoly graphs right here question asked which of the following statements best describes what the diagram is illustrating so the diagram might look a little confusing, huh? Yeah, might look a little confusing. You all kind of price going over there, marginal revenue, marginal cost, average total cost, price, average revenue equal demand, quantity. So a lot of stuff going on right there. So the question asks us here, what does it best illustrate in this form? Is it A, the firm is making losses? Is it B, the firm is making normal profits? Is it C, the firm is making excess profits? Or is it D, the firm is making zero economic profits? So a whole lot of terms going on here. So let's look, let's, look at, let's look at it here. So we have to look at certain key, key uh, parts of the graph. For example, we have to focus on marginal costs. All right, that little curve there. We have to focus on marginal revenue and average total costs. Now, keep in mind that for a monopoly firm, if uh, most firms in general, most firms in general, if their average total cost is, let's say, above the price, if it's above the price, see right there, if, if it's above the price, or if it intersects the marginal cost above the price, then we have problems, right? We have problems. That would mean that the firm is making losses. Had it been normal, then the price and the intersection would have been tangent right it would have been tangent had it been profits then the price would have been way above where they intersect but seeing as all that's not the case the best answer here is let's see now the best answer here is a the firm is making losses why do i say it's making losses because again this is price p1 we see where the MR and the MC intersect, so the MR and the MC, they intersect right there, but it is below where the average total cost and the marginal cost intersect is below. And so that means, what that is really saying that your price is lower than the average total cost. So as it produce one unit, the price is still in it for is lower than the actual cost and that is a recipe for losses right a recipe for losses so don't let the whole graph confuse you you're looking for the mc the atc and the price if the price is below where the atc and the mc intersects then we are looking at losses if the price is above where the atc and mc intersects then that it would be profits and if the price 
and all of them are tangent then that would be zero economic profits right zero economic profits okay good so we're on to number 19 now okay we're on to number 19 because 18 again is a the firm is making losses number 19 the income elasticity of demand for cars is five if a recession causes a decrease of 20 percent in incomes then the quantity of cars demanded is likely to and so we have some options here increase by 25 percent increase by 100 percent decrease by 25 percent decrease by 100 percent and so let's look at it one time we know that if there is a, a recession and there's a decrease in incomes then there's no way your demand will be going anywhere so the demand for quantity of cars is likely to go down let's look at for out the way so it has to be c or d cannot be a or b because there will be no increase in the demand for cars because it's a recession money tight incomes are decreasing so then the quantity of cars demand now with that said we remember we're talking about elasticity so the question here is fall by how much how much would it fall by and so we have to go and do some math so they gave us the income elasticity coefficient so they already worked out the whole income elasticity already they're saying that the income elasticity of demand for cars is five what that means is that for every percentage change in for every one percent change in income the demand for cars would either fall by five so let's look at it now so we, we already said that it's not going to increase so what, what is it c or d now we said that the five represents the change in quantity demanded for every one percent change in income so in this case income decreased by 20 percent so it's negative okay, it's going to fall so therefore the if we multiply the five by the 20 percent we will get 100 and so the answer for this one is d 100 that's what the maths is telling us here it will decrease by 100 the supply curve will shift to the left if the supply curve will shift to the left if a income falls b cost production rises c cost of production falls or d technology is introduced so which one of these will cause a shift of the supply curve to the right to the left meaning that supply has fallen shift to the left means supply has fallen income affects demand so it cannot be a cost of production rise if the cost of production rises then you will supply less and so the answer is b cost of production rise so the answer for 20 is b the cost of production rise if the cost of production falls then that would mean that the supply curve that means you supply more right you supply more because the cost is less you can you can make more out of what you used to before if technology is introduced again you will supply more and so the curve would shift to the right so that is why those are not the answers number 21 now 21 a normal supply curve for farm produce will slope upwards from left to right if farmers a pass on increased cost to customers b are willing to produce more as price increases c increase their profit margins as price increases or d are willing to increase supply as demand increases and so the best answer for this one is let's see because we're saying that normal we're talking about normal good normal supply curve normal behavior would be that a lot of supply states that as the price rises supply rises and so if you're saying here that it slope upwards from left to right is normal that means that the relationship between price and supply is positive they go in the same direction and so the that says b they are willing to produce more as the price increases so 21 the answer is b they are willing to produce more as the price increases it's a normal supply curve and that's the normal law that governs supply as price go up you produce more because price and supply number 22 let's look at number 22 quickly number 22 it says 
Mr. Philip had intended to buy 50 pens at $8. When the price rose to $10, he decided to buy only 40 pens. His elasticity of demand for pens is okay, so it's not it's not zero, right? And so let's just look at the maths and see what it might be. Let's work out this one here. So we know the answer. Okay, so the answer is C. 0 0.80. How did we reach there? So now we have to go and look at the elasticity formula and try to work that one out. This right here is the elasticity formula, as you can see on the screen. It's percentage change in quantity demanded over percentage change in price. And we have how we find the percentage change in quantity demanded. What you have to do is look at the change in what they wanted to demand and what they ended up demanding the change between those two so for this one it's going to be 10 because they wanted to buy 5 but they end up buying 40 so the change between 40 and 50 <coughs> is 10 10 pence so that's the percentage change right there so let's look at the math so the percentage change would be like I said the change is 10 so to find the percentage change now you have to put the 10 over the original the original demand was 50 so it would be 10 over 50 sorry over 50 times 100 we get 20 right so the percentage change in the percentage change in demand is 20 percent 20 percent change put that aside put it in your pocket now we have to work out the percentage change in the price i remember that the price the original price was eight and then the price went up to ten so now there's a there's a difference of two so now we have to look out what the percentage change is so it would be two two into eight times one zero zero and we get 25 okay good so we have 20 and 25 that's what we're working with the percentage change in demand over the percentage change in price so that's 20 over 25 20 over 25 so if you have 20 over 25 times 100 zero zero, we get 80 or 0 0.80 right you don't have to you don't have to do it over 100 sorry right you don't have to do it over 100 so, but you get 0 0.80 and so that that is why the answer for that one is 0 0.80 let's look at 23 now the relationship between price and quantity demanded of a normal good is described as a direct b shift c inverse or d non-existent the answer already circled is inverse right I, I did not switch to the other one so it's inverse what does this mean inverse means that price and quantity demanded goes in opposite directions so when price goes up Quantity demanded goes down. When price goes down, quantity demanded goes up. They move in different directions, and so the relationship is inverse. One goes up when the other one goes down, so they move in different directions. So that's 23 for you. Number 24 refers to the following table, which gives the short run schedule of three firms, X, Y, and Z, which comprise an industry. So we have firm X, Y, and Z. Price at the dollar. Firm X can produce 100. Firm Y and Z. Nope. At $2. Firm X, 150. Firm Y jumping into the market for 50. Firm Z, nada. At $3. Firm X producing at 200. Firm Y, 80. Then firm Z finally jump into the market at 70. At $4. Firm X produced 50, Y 150, and Z 100. So the question here is, which of the following price quantity combinations would occur on the short run supply schedule of the industry? On the short run supply schedule of the industry. And remember, we said that short run is that period of time. It can be different for different industries, right? But it's now a period of time where if a firm is making nice profits everybody run into the firm run into the market and start producing but in the long run as 
profits start getting eroded, some firms will back out. So we're looking at the short term here now. But the options kind of limit us. So A, 2 and 300 units. So when the price is $2, how many units are produced? We have 150 plus 50, that's 250 right there. That's 250 units. At B, we have $3 for 350. So that's B, we have 200 plus 80 plus 70. That gives us the total amount that the market is producing. And that would give us 350. At $4, we have what? That's not 650. That's 250 and one. That's three. That's four. That's 500, right? That's 500. And so the best answer would be what? Let's see. The best answer for 24 is services. B. Three dollars at 350. So at three dollars in the short run, you see that we get 350 units. So that's B. Number 25. 25. Governments often put measures in place to control monopolies because monopolies A set fair prices, ha, B restrict supply, yes, C earn normal profits, or D promote consumer sovereignty. Yeah, right. So the best answer for 25 would be clearly B because they restrict supply. Right? So the best answer for 25 is B, they restrict supply. Monopolies do not really produce at that optimal point. Right, we uh, as most with perfect competition, you, you produce where you have the equilibrium. Monopolies would restrict supply, right? And so that would cause the price to be a little higher. So, government had to intervene, or else the prices would be ridiculous. All right, 26. The price elasticity of supply refers to the responsiveness of quantities supplied to a change in so price elasticity of supply. So, of course, it's going to be a change in the price of the good. So that's number 26 is C. Number 27 refers to the following information which relates to a manufacturing company. Total fixed cost, 10,000. Total cost, 50,000. Output, 100 units. So this one we have seen on many past papers. So the average variable cost is, we have seen this one on many past papers. And the answer for this one, of course, is Let's see, let's see, 400, right, 400. How did we get 400? Let's look at the maths. Pull out our trusty calculator. So, here we go. So, clearly, remember, remember we said that your total cost is a combination of variable cost and fixed cost. Fixed cost is 10,000, total cost is 50. So, therefore, Variable cost is 40,000. Now, to get the average variable cost, you have to divide the 40,000 by the outputs. So, we have 40,000 divided by 100 units equal 400. And that is why 400 is the average variable cost. So, that's 27. 28. Education is a... A, merit good because it is described, it is desirable for the economy. B, public good because it is desirable for the economy. C, a merit good because it's non-diminishable, non-excludable. D, a public good because it is non-diminishable and non-excludable. So a lot of words are thrown around here. So what is the answer for this one? So first and foremost, we know education is a merit good. So it, it's not a public good. Why is it not a public good? Because persons can be excluded and the quality can diminish especially based on how many persons are accessing that level of education for example if you have a class with let's say 100 persons then the quality of education would diminish because one teacher cannot really teach so many students so we know it's not a public good because it can be it's, it, people can be excluded for socioeconomic reasons and it's diminishable so it's a merit good but why is it a merit good so the best answer for this one, 28, why is it a merit good? Is because it is desirable for the economy. It's a merit good because if more persons are educated, that would benefit the economy on a whole. And that is why you have laws in place that make sure persons go to school for at least up to what? 16? Now we ever because they know an educated populace is better than 
none so it is a merit good for that reason 29 which of the following is likely to occur when there is a when there is market failure a the production of goods and services create benefits for third parties and in b an increase in poverty throughout the economy c an adequate amount of goods and services for consumers or d an increase in the level of un employment among skilled and unskilled laborers which one is the least likely least that's a keyword the least likely so if you're looking at the definition of market failure a market fails when that market <laughs> fails okay or that market isn't able to properly allocate resources it doesn't optimally allocate resources so in other words the least likely thing that can happen here is that c an adequate amount of goods and services for consumers because that goes very contrary to the definition of of market failure because in market failures either the market is, is producing too much too little never adequate that is why it's market failure it's either producing producing too much or too little and depending on what the good is it can lead to positive or negative externalities right so the and the best answer for me is c 30 a pure public good can be described as a excludable b non-rival c diminishable or d complementary a pure public good pure public good and of course we know when it comes to a public good a, a public good is a good that you cannot be excluded so it's non excludable so is they have your excludable no you cannot be excluded from a public good so that's scratch that diminishable it is non diminishable scratch that complementary that doesn't link to this whole topic so the best answer here though is b non rival right a pure public good is b non rival okay so that's 30 of 60 we'll study it for now make sure you tune in for the next 30 questions Part two of the May June 2022 CSEC Economics Paper One. Make sure you stay tuned for the next one. We don't want a video going too long. And I also realize that some of you persons out there, you do not check for the second paper, second half. I've had the January 2022 or 2023 uh, POB paper up, part one and part two, but part one has like three. 3,000 views whereas part 2 has like 1,000 something views so per people you have to look for part 2 we don't want a whole two hour paper right the algorithm tell you that people don't watch for more than like 15 20 minutes so we try to make them as short as possible right so look for part 2 coming out again check the description for links if you want to purchase any any packages for studying some contain completed paper one some contain just the blanks some contain past papers some uh, paper twos trees some contain the slides some contain the textbooks for various subjects so check them out all of those five us um using whatever means of, of of credit card or whatever so you can get your study going on right some of the textbooks out there cost way more so five would not be anything that would really break compared to the actual cost of the, the, the textbooks out there right so stay tuned thanks for watching